All right, so let's continue our discussion about the differential gene expression. So we have been spent quite some time on this topic because I think this is the most statistical topic among all bioinformatics analysis. So for gene differential expression, this topic, we started talking about those classical methods like the two sample t-test, it's Welch's correction, and the F test for sample variance. And also we talk about the non-parametric permutation test. So we give you a lot of options for that. And we say that they have, um, so like t-test assumes a normal distribution or a large sample size. And for the permutation test, it requires a large sample size to work. Otherwise it you wouldn't have any power. And one thing I didn't mention is the Will Coxon's rank sum test, which doesn't necessarily test the mean difference, but it's also a non-parametric test that can be used to compare two distributions. So we talked about those, and then we said that these tests all require on the assumption that your data are normalized, which means that a gene's expression values in different samples are comparable in the same unit. So we talk about normalization methods. And so in the last lecture, we talk about that combat method, which does a more complicated type of normalization. And so basically we'll try to assume a negative binomial distribution and try to remove some batch effects in the adjustment and then try to generate a new count from the adjusted normal distribution by matching the quant by matching the tail probability, matching the quantile. So that's how it works. And similar to the comeback, we talk about uh, two other methods that also assumes the negative binomial distribution, HR and DEC2. So we introduced the negative binomial distribution last time, and today we're going to continue this discussion about DEC2. So basically compared to like t-test, uh, I would say this uh, negative binomial, bi binomial assumption is similar. So it's, they are both some parametric distribution to describe the data uncertainty. And people think negative binomial is more natural for modeling counts, while the normal distribution obviously is for continuous values. So that's why I would say in the field, there is a big controversy about whether it's better to do some count plus one log transformation. So then zero will stay at zero and you're going to shrink those large counts to be smaller after the log transformation. So the data like the genes, a genes expression values in samples will be more like a bell shaped. Then you could apply any tests or models that assume normal distribution like the t-test. So these will become applicable. But, I, but on the other hand, you could also try to do it without using the normal log transformation. Instead, you start with the raw counts directly after some adjustment for sure, but still you want to model counts, then you have this option of negative binomial. So I would say that the debate between whether it's better to model counts directly or do the log transformation transformation and do normal assumption, there's no definite answer to my knowledge. But if you find down something, I will be very happy to know. Um, I would say it's more from a kind of philosophical point of view. Some people will say, oh, I think it's better to do less pre-processing and just model the counts directly. But some other people will say, oh, we really want to use this powerful normally distributed assumption based methods because they are known to be very powerful, then I would go for that. So I will leave this as an open question for you guys to be aware of, but I would say this DEC2 and NEDGR, they took a different route. They didn't do log transformation, they modeled accounts. So as a recap of what we did last time, in DEC2, the model is the negative binomial. So let's say that here we pull the samples from more than one condition into this count matrix. So each column is a sample and the sample has its own indicator about which condition it is from. So we regard that as one of our sample covariate. Like let's say we have our, a lot of covariates here and for the rth covariate, let's say maybe the first one is the sample condition covariate. Okay, so therefore, in this case, we denote the gene i's count in sample J as K, capital K-I-J. 
And we assume this follows a normal distribution, oh, sorry, follows a negative binomial distribution with mean mu ij and a gene specific dispersion alpha i, which doesn't depend on sample j, but the mean depends on sample j. The reason is that we will try to use a generalized linear model to explain this mean using sample covariate. So here they have two steps. So first, I think this is specific for the bioinformatics, this G62. So they try to first adjust the size factor of sample J by doing this. So in other words, you see that this size factor, for example, the library size was adjusted before modeling the relationship between the true mean and the covariates. So you can consider this QIJ as the true mean. And here, its actual meaning is that it's the relative abundance of gene I in sample J among all genes. And so basically, it's the total library size times of a proportion, proportion for gene I. And then this is the generalized linear model part. It's assumed, we're assuming that the log transformation of the relative abundance is equal to some linear model. And the linear model has is equal to the effect of each covariate times the covariate specific effect. So basically, if we consider one of the covariates, say r equals one, has the sample j's condition, say condition one or condition two. Then in this case, the corresponding coefficient called beta i1 would be the condition effect on gene i. So usually, you know, we previously we talked about two condition analysis. Then if it's two conditions, then we can encode one condition as zero, one condition as one. Then we have only one beta I1, and that will be the effect of condition one relative to condition zero. But if you have more than two conditions, say conditions one, two, and three, then in our linear model, we will try to code this condition as a categorical factor, not a, not a numerical variable anymore. The reason is that the effect, the difference between condition one and condition two may be different from the difference of condition two, between condition two and condition three. So therefore you don't want to enforce that the, the condition one, two, three, the, that order actually means something. So that's why you need to do that so-called zero one coding. So let me just make this clear. So let's say that you have, you have, so let's say if you have three conditions, so this is something we need to deal with specific in our linear modeling. So we will treat condition as a categorical variable. Okay, so when we do this, then we, we need to set a baseline condition. Let's say we set condition one as the baseline. Okay, and then you are going to have two covariates to indicate whether this sample J is in condition two or not, whether it is in condition three or not. So when you set up the, the problem like this, then the effect you're looking at is the effect of condition two relative to condition one and the effect of condition three relative to condition two. So in other words, so for example here, I would have say for sample J, I will actually have two covariates. So one covariate, covariate to indicate, indicate whether sample J is in condition two. Okay, you need to have a covariate as an indicator for this, zero, one. And you have another covariate to indicate whether sample J is in condition three, okay? So therefore, let's imagine in the sample J, if it's for those two covariates, if it's zero, zero, it will mean that sample J is in condition one. Okay, and it could be one, zero, then it's in condition two or zero one, then it's in condition three. 
So you only have those three options, possibilities for the sample just covariates. So therefore, using this zero one coding, you are able to estimate two beta something, beta i's, two beta i's, one for the effect of condition two relative to condition one, one for the effect of condition three relative to condition two. So if any, if either one is non-zero, when you run a statistical test, you will call this gene a DE gene. Okay, that's the idea of doing this linear model-based testing of differential expression. So you can generalize that two condition comparison to more than two conditions. That's why this DE-seq2 using the linear model formulation is very flexible. And it's actually more flexible than the two sample t-test. And also as a side note for everyone's information, you can consider the two sample t-test as a special case of a linear model when you have two, two conditions. So moving here, what I'm trying to say is that you can consider the linear model, linear model, or we can also call it linear regression, is more general than two sample t-test. So to make it more specific, let's say that in this case, if you if we assume the gene expression count, I'm not going to use the K, this is for count. Let's say that we have X, I, J, okay? And still gene I's expression in sample J, let's say that we assume as normally distributed, as normally distributed, okay? And this assumption can only be satisfied if you do some log transformation. Like I said, say log count plus one transformation. Let's say that this is our assumption. Then your distribution can be written as xij following, I would say mu ij, still the mean, and the variance, let me divide, define a sigma i square, which depends on the gene only, not sample. So compared to the MB, you see we have a similar setup. We have the mean involving J, but the other parameter, and in statistics, some people call this auxiliary parameter, means that it's not a parameter of your interest, but you must have it. And the other parameter is only gene specific. So in this linear model setting, not generalized linear model, but just linear model, you are going to assume mu ij equals to some covariate, okay? So let me just say that in this case, we can write it as x j one times theta i one plus x j two plus uh, times, sorry, times beta i two. So let's say this. Then in our three condition comparison, we would have xj1 indicating whether sample j is in condition two, okay? And then xj2 is another indicator of a whether sample j is in condition three. So one of them may be one, and both of them can be zero. So it's just a zero one encoding. Then correspondingly, let's just see that. In this case, just imagine. So if we have xj1 equals zero, xj2 equals one, it means sample j is in condition three. Then you can see that, okay, I forgot the intercept. I should put it here. I will call mu i zero. That's the intercept. So then you can see mu ij is equal to beta i2 plus mu i0. This will be the mean you can expect for this gene i, okay, when it's in condition three. When xi1 is one, xj2 is zero, it's in condition two. Then mu a is equal to beta i1 plus mu i0. Finally, if both are zero, then mu ij is just equal to mu i0. So you can see that for the three conditions, when the sample j belongs to one of the three conditions, 
you will get its respective mean, mu i j. So th this is how we use linear model to explain the condition difference. And you can see that when we just have two conditions, then I can reduce, remove one of the covariates, only keep one covariate, and that coefficient is the effect. So therefore, here in our case, so whether gene i is de between any conditions, then it's basically testing this question. Are beta i2 and beta beta i1 and beta i2 both zero? You are going to test this null hypothesis. And that becomes a linear regression problem. So we have a set of techniques to do to solve this problem. So I hope I make this clear. So this regression formulation is more general and it is able to consider many different scenarios. Like the condition is categorical, more than two. The condition may even be continuous. So for example, in our single cell data, gene expression data, you may have a covariate called the pseudo time which means that you order the sales in the continuous order. So the sale will receive pseudo time as one, two, up to the number of sales. Yeah, so given that pseudo time variable, you order the sales, you may wonder which gene has differential expression along the pseudo time. Then in this case, you are going to put a pseudo time as a covariate and you're interested in whether its coefficient is equal to zero or not. So this is a very general. And coming back to the DEC2, do we have questions for this, by the way, before I move on move back to DEC2, the linear regression way of doing testing? No. Okay, so I will retouch this problem later to as a better clarification. Okay, then coming back to DEC2, this is their model. And let's continue with the, you know, the, the reading of this paper. But actually I have a question for you guys. So. Do you seek to try to use a two-step way to write the mu i j? First, mu i j equals to s j times q i j, then log q i j equals to this. Is this really necessary? Or do you, you can, can you combine those two steps into one step? Any thoughts from our audience? Can I directly just write log mu i j equals to something? as in our standard generalized linear model setting. Actually, I can give the answer. I think the answer is yes, because if you write this log mu ij, you can have it equal to log sj plus log qij. So anything you put down here can move up and then log sj, you can just consider to be some constants, you know, you can shift it. But anyway, it's just a way to write the model. It doesn't matter that much. All right, so let's see what they did, right? So the question here is to ask for DC2 is to estimate this mu ir, all the, all the for all r's. And why is this important? By the way, I forgot to mention that this regression framework has another advantage. You can incorporate any confounders you want to adjust. You can put the confounder into your model as a covariate. So therefore, any condition effects you estimate will be conditional on the confounders. So you remove whatever confounders that can adjust, the, that can explain the mean difference from the model. And then the remaining mean difference is the condition effect. So just to explain what we mean by confounder. So let's say that you have samples from two conditions, right? But just all of a sudden, you know that, oh, I just contaminated one batch. So all the values are altered. So in this case, the batch would definitely be a confounder and you want to include it into your model. So in other words, if your model itself, to put it, put it this way, if your model can directly account for batches, then you don't need batch correction before using the model, right? So you could put batch as one part into your model. So you do the parameter estimation for the DE effect together with the confounder adjustment. You don't have to do a two step. So therefore, I would say that to the like for methods like combat, right? Which does the specific 
data normalization, batch effect removal before any downstream data analysis. I will say that methods like those are, are designed for users who are probably not aware if their downstream method can do batch effect correction. Then you have to do the batch effect correction separately. But in the case of DEC2, if the batch effect is already part of the model, then you don't necessarily need to do previous batch effect correction. Does that make sense? Okay, so I would strongly suggest that maybe after this class, sometime that you may want to learn this further, but I would strongly suggest that I would say if I want to pick one model that's most worth learning among all statistics for bioinformatician, bioinformaticians, I would say it's linear models. So try to le learn linear models, the multivariate linear model, that's the most useful thing. And you can explain a lot of methods we use nowadays. All right, so then, Coming back to the DEC2, right, so this is what it is, right? They use this logarithmic link and the parameter, the beta IRs are the ways to, are the things they care about. Okay, so let's read this. In the simplest case of a comparison between two groups, such as treated and controlled samples, the design matrix elements indicate whether a sample J is treated or not. The same thing as I, as I said, and the GLM fit returns coefficients indicating the overall expression strength of the gene and the log to the full change between treatment and control. So this is the coefficient. This is the intercept. The use of linear models, however, pro provides the flexibility to also analyze more complex designs, as is often useful in genomic studies like the compounders. So this is what I want to talk about today: the empirical-based shrinkage estimate for the dispersion parameter. So there's another parameter, this alpha i, which also needs to be estimated. Okay, so within group variability, that is the variability between replicates is modeled by the dispersion parameter alpha i, which describes the variance accounts via, this is the relationship we, re we wrote about negative binomial, right? The variance of a negative binomial random variable is equal to the mean plus dispersion times mean square. Accurate estimation of dispersion parameter alpha is critical for the statistical inference of differential expression. For studies with large sample sizes, this is usually not a problem. For controlled experiments, however, sample sizes tend to be smaller. This is the same as what we talk about for t-test. The sample size may only be three for each condition, two or three replicates, resulting in highly variable dispersion estimates for each gene. If used directly, these noisy estimates would compromise the accuracy of differential expression testing, okay? So one sensible solution is to share information across genes. And that's what we use in empirical base. If you recall, for that two sample t test problem, we assume the variance parameter follows an inverse chi square prior, right? And that's a conjugate prior to its likelihood, which is based on the fact that a sample variance follows chi square distribution. So together, likelihood multiplies the prior, which will give us the posterior that turns out to be still inverse chi-square. So remember in that case, we would actually obtain a Bayesian estimate for the variance. And that Bayesian estimate is a weighted sum of the sample variance we computed from data and the prior mean. So at that time we said, oh, the prior mean parameter, which is a hyperparameter in the prior distribution is unknown. How do we deal with it? We try to estimate it from data. And to estimate that hyperparameter, we are essentially pooling our genes together to estimate that common higher prime hyperparameter. So that's why here the, the, the essence of the bias is to pull your features together to estimate the common hyperparameter. Okay, and that's the shared information. In DEC2, we assume that genes of similar average expression strength have similar dispersion. We here explain the concepts of our approach using as examples a data set by this with RNA-seq data for mice of two different strains, another data set with RNA-seq data for human lymphoblastoid 
cell lines for the mathematical details C method. Okay, so let's look at the high level understanding. We first treat each gene separately and estimate gene wise dispersion estimates using maximum likelihood. So in this case, you see, because every gene I has its own distribution, okay, has its own distribution. So basically what we could do is that we could use the ML at maximum likelihood estimation approach to estimate this gene specific alpha I because to estimate that, we don't need to use data from other genes. Okay, so let's say we have the alpha I hat for gene I, but we know these alpha I hat have large uncertainty. They have large variance, not stable. We want to make them more stable. So then what they do is that, next we determine the location parameter of the distribution of these estimates to allow for dependence on average gene expression strength. All right, so let's look at a smooth curve. Make this smaller. This is what it is. So basically, you can see that, just think about this x-axis as the mean of normalized counts. So let's just say that here in this model, it's the estimate of mu ij after you exclude the covariate effect. Okay, so basically you can imagine this, consider this to be, that's why they said normalized. So you can consider this to be just the mean expression with the intercept estimate only. So in this case, you have one term as the intercept and the other terms are the effects of some covariance like condition or some confounders. They all add up together. But for the x-axis, you remove those confounder covariate effects from the estimate. And this is the alpha I had. So one dot per gene. So you may see this is one gene, this is another gene, this is another gene. And what they're doing here is to fit a smooth curve by a function, you know, the R, you can fit a smooth function by calling this low S function. So if you haven't tried it before, you can look at it. It's just a smoothing technique. Given a scatter plot, it will fit a smoothing scatter line here. And then what the authors did is that they will try to push the dispersion to the line. So in other words, you take the vertical difference between each alpha I hat and what's on the line given the mean, and you, you just do the subtraction of the difference. So then the dispersion will lie on the line. So this is the author's way of making the alpha I hat more stable and by sharing information across all genes. But I can tell you that without going to the mathematical detail, this will create bias in the dispersion estimates. And that's unavoidable. The reason is that the MLE estimates, the dots you see here, they are actually unbiased. So we know that they're unbiased estimates for the alpha i, for the true parameter. However, they have large variance. So here the price we pay is that we make the estimates biased using the empirical Bayes approach, but we make the estimates more stable, smaller variance. So that's what the authors did. And then with that, they can finally do the so this is the basic. So with those estimates from UIJ, alpha I, and also the betas. So basically the alphas will actually be used actually in the way adjust for the betas. Or maybe I shouldn't say adjust for beta. Not adjust for the beta I had. These are the estimates, they, they keep them. But used for the testing. But to test whether each beta I are, especially the one for your condition covariate, is that beta IR equal to zero? To run that test, they will need the dispersion parameter estimates. So that's why they will supply the estimates there into the test. So I try to give the high level idea of the SDSIG2 method, but as I said, it's whole design, especially the empirical base part is for the small sample size consideration. Because the sample size is so small, you don't have better option. You want to achieve a stable estimate for alpha i, but you cannot. So the empirical base offers one option, but we have to be aware that 
the estimate may be severely biased. So that's why we might have some issues about the p-value calculation, which is something I will talk about next. But for now, do we have any questions about what I just said at a high level about what's, what this method is essentially doing? Because this is one of the most widely used method in bioinformatics. Everybody, everybody performs DEG expression analysis and they would use HR or HR or DC2, those two methods. And they have very similar cores in terms of their statistical design. So I didn't touch their testing part yet because I feel like that's kind of technical, but the, on the high level, the key is that they try to use gene expression. Uh, they try to use empirical bias to estimate the gene specific dispersion parameter by borrowing information from other genes. Yeah, so you see, so this is, uh, this is actually their, how they try to estimate it's in their method. So basically, let me go down here. They have the gene-wise dispersion estimate by maximum likelihood, and they fit a dispersion trend, which is the curve we just saw. And they try to justify it, I would say. They try to justify it. This, is far, this falls below the empirical base framework. And they have this final dispersion estimate. And finally, they have, they also have their specific way of estimating log flow change, which is the output of it. And finally, let's go to the testing part. They do the wall test, which is the standard test for the generalized linear model. So if you check any generalized linear model textbook, they use the wall test. And the wall test is essentially trying to test whether each beta here, each beta IR is equal to zero. So you can consider this to be like a fancier, more complicated version, more general version of the t-test. But still, the idea is quite similar. Okay, so, right. So DSC2 has a lot of components, a lot of statistical techniques used in it. And I would say, if you look at the method and, there's, and the package is very well written, so no wonder it becomes very popular and the dominant role, dominant tool in the field. But as I said, it's designed for small sample sizes. So when we have big sample sizes, I have a question for you. How can you make sure whether the DEC2 is doing all right? Is it is really controlling the type one error and the false discovery rate, the two criteria we talked before? Is there a way for us to, to check it? We actually provided with the answer, right? We can do permutation. So when you have a large sample size, what you can do is that you can shuffle the samples condition labels to create samples from the null. That means the conditions have no real difference. And then you could apply DEC2. And then you could check whether the resulting p-values you get from the permitted data. So in that case, all genes should be non-DE. And whether the p-values follow the zero to one uniform distribution, as we said in the previous lecture, does the, is the theoretical condition actually hold? So that's something you could check. And also another thing to check is the false discovery rate, right? So supposedly, with the p-values and with the benjamini hodgeberg procedure for controlling the, P, controlling the FDR, then the resulting FDR should be controlled under the target, say 5%. And we could make sure of that. So what's the idea of doing that check? So here, after the permutation, what you could do is that you could apply DEC2 to each permitted data set. And whenever DEC2 costs any genes as DE, then you would know all those genes are false positives, right? Because there should not be any positives. So in this case, let me ask you this question. So if any of the genes are, are called false positive, let me just grab another piece of paper. So let's say that we permute, let's say we have permuted, so permuted data set, one, 
And let's say we can do this for 1000 times, okay? And we apply DEC2 or HR to each data set. So we will have a these genes found from set one. So DE gene set one to 1000. So some of them could be. So, but if it's not empty, what I can tell you is that here, the FDP, false discovery proportion, by definition, is the proportion of false positives among the so-called positives, the discovered DE genes. So therefore, because anything that's discovered is false, so the FDP is either one or zero, okay? So some of them may be one, some may be zero, and you are going to have 1,000 of those. And then finally, to compute the FDR, you are going to approximate it by the average of the FDP. The reason is that here, we don't actually get to see the whole population. The FDPs are the realizations we get, right? And we know that the FDR is defined as the expectation of the FDP. So in this case, to approximate expectation is to take the average. So in other words, here, the average FDP would be the proportion of ones among the permutations. So then we can check and we can compare this FDR to the target 5% to see whether it's large or not. Okay, so basically this is what we did in our recent, in the recent preprint. I can show that here. So in the recent preprint, we actually checked this idea and we surprisingly found that there are FDR inflation issues with the uh, DC to an HR. So let me quickly pull that up. So this is a preprint of our manuscript. And so we basically raised this question about whether this is a large sample size crisis or not, because it seems that DEC to an HR doesn't have controlled FDR for large sample sizes. So let me quickly scroll down to the figure. So in this figure, right, in this figure, so what we're doing is that we did 1000 permutations and for each permuted data set, we used the 5% FDR threshold to call DE genes from it. And here the red dots are the number of DE genes from our original data. And the bar plot and the error bar shows the distribution of the number of DE genes called from permuted data. So you can see that, and this is an immunotherapy data set, we compare two groups of patients, one from pre-treatment, one from post-treatment. So Comparing their gene expression, then we can see which gene has changed expression after the treatment. So it's a way to evaluate the effect of immunotherapy. But you see that a lot of the permitted data sets have even more DE genes found than from the original data. So this is clearly a sign that something's not right, right? You couldn't cut more genes as DE from permitted data. And so we saw this issue from DC2 and HR for DC2 and HR. And so actually in this data, in, the, in this study with very large sample sizes from two conditions, we actually recommend Wilcoxon rank sum test as the better approach. Because given your sample size is so large, a non-parametric test like Wilcoxon that doesn't assume the data to follow a normal distribution or any parametric form of distribution or negative binomial distribution is actually making a less assumption. So it will be less affected by any what we call model misspecification, which means that your assumed distribution doesn't really fit the data. And also we can see that in here, we compare the genes that are running Describe identifies DE from permuted data versus other genes, and we do the goodness of fit test. Here we reverse it to make called poor risk of, of fit, which means the higher the value, the poorer the fit is. So we can see that 
Indeed, for those mistakenly called DE genes, they have poor fit for the negative binomial distribution. So that's another evidence to show that checking the model assumption is very important. But for DE621HR, I think they were originally defined, designed for small sample size, like three replicates per condition. So in that case, you don't have a better choice. Non-parametric tests will not work. You have to assume a parametric model. So negative binomial is the reasonable model, I would say in that case. And also because they're replicates, right? So you know that the variation comes from biological variation and also maybe the measurement noise. So in that case, people have shown that negative binomial can be a reasonable model to describe the variance. But in our study, here, the large sample with the population level study, each sample is not a biological replicate, but from an individual, a person. So in this case, we can imagine that the, this, the variance among individuals, like the patients, could be much larger than the variance among biological replicates. So that's why it's, possible, it's reasonable that here the negative binomial fit is not good for those patient data. So that's why we cannot stick with the negative binomial assumption and use DE stick to an HR. So hopefully I think I try to convey the message to our audience that in the future when you do data analysis, it's very important that you try to check the method and see whether there's some parametric assumption there and whether that assumption is really explained, can really fit your data. So if that's not something you are sure, my suggestion is that we have a statistics core here at UCLA in the medical school in the JCCC, the Cancer Center. So it's a good place to really do consultation and really make sure that the method is statistically appropriate for your problem. Okay, so that's all I wanna say for this part. And also just as a, maybe before I conclude this differential expression part, a last message I want to say, and it's really like an advertisement for our own method is that, so in my group, we develop a method called Clipper, which try to avoid the issue with p-values. As I said, so there can be multiple issues with the p-value calculation. If you're unsure about what is the correct null distribution of your test statistic, then the p-values could be invalid. So in this case, the Benjamin Hodgeberg, the one we introduced, cannot control the FDR. So in that case, I think we propose a solution for you to get rid of the reliance on p-values. You can directly go from your data to a summary statistic to the FDR control. So that saves the trouble of deriving the null distribution. And I think that can make the analysis more transparent and convenient. So I hope this is something people are interested in trying and give us feedback. All right, so that concludes my long discussion about differential analysis. So do we have questions before I move on to our next big topic? And let me try to reshare my screen. So, All right, so. All right, so if there are no questions, then the next topic I want to say is the supervised learning versus unsupervised learning, a big distinction in machine learning, or I can say statistical machine learning. So for the supervised learning part, I will be brief, which is not a really focus of this class. The supervised learning, even though it's largely regard and it's the most common machine learning problem, you try to predict something. Okay, so even though it's largely regarded as a prediction task, but also want to say that we can also have an inference component in it. Again, the prediction versus inference thing we mentioned in the first class. Okay, so we have already seen this a little bit in our discussion about generalized linear model. So let me try to use logistic regression as a starting point to see, yeah, it is a method that can both do prediction and inference. So for supervised learning, prediction inference is one way to categorize it. Another way to categorize it is whether the, the thing you want to predict, the outcome is a categorical, categorical outcome, or some people call it response versus continuous 
continuous outcome or response. Okay, so for the former one, we call this the classification problem. And for the latter one, we call it a regression problem. So that's another way to categorize supervised learning methods or tasks. All right, so for the classification problem, the outcome is binary. So I will I should introduce the setting first. So in the setting in supervised learning, we would have a Y, which is a n dimensional vector. So I can write it as Y1 to Yn. Okay, and this is our data. So for our data, I use the lowercase. And also we have a set of so-called features, predictors, covariates, they mean the same thing. I put in the matrix, big X, okay? So in this X, I write it as say X11 to X1P, XN1 to XNP, okay? So in this case, I would have N observations. This is a statistics language. And also some people call that N instances. People use this in machine learning. And some people may even say vaguely N data points. And for the columns, we say we have P features. That's a machine learning word or P predictors or P covariates. The latter two are more in the statistics field, okay. So this, this is the setup. And what we try to do is that we want to use this to find a function f. Find a function f that maps from a p-dimensional space to a one-dimensional space. So that's the function f we want to find. And so that the goal is that for, for a new new observation, okay, with only X observed, let's say X star, we can predict the unobserved Y star accurately. This is the key, accurately as F X star. So we want to find this map so that the observation X star, sorry, I should say this is P dimensional. Okay, like a row here. We want to predict the outcome, which is a scalar by F X star. This is the ultimate goal of supervised learning. Any type of supervised learning problem can be formulated in this goal. And so therefore we need a model, right? So it depends on what we do. So I have said it can be prediction inference, categorical or continuous. Another way to categorize a supervised learning algorithm is that whether you want the algorithm to be probabilistic or algorithmic. That's another way to categorize it. So for probabilistic model, I can give you one example for classification task. So let's say the example for classification, logistic regression is one of a probabilistic model. So in other words, you assume um, the data comes from a probability distribution and versus an algorithm, algorithmic a method would be neural network. Okay. So basically for probabilistic thing, we need to have some assumption about the distribution of our data. While for algorithmic, there's no assumption about the distribution. So let's start with, and both are, these two are both for classification. They can both be used for classification, but different perspectives. Okay, so for probabilistic perspective, let's say that probabilistic perspective, when you write this any observation, let's say we write any observation y as f applies to the feature vector 
we can see that there is a random error term. Okay, this epsilon is the deviation between what you observe and what you expect. So therefore, this that error, epsilon follows what distribution is the specification. Okay. Okay, what distribution does epsilon follow? That's your model assumption. That's the key. Okay, so I'm saying that this is what we need. So for example, let's say that, so if epsilon follows say normal distribution with mean zero variance sequence squared. This is what we use for linear model. So in this case, you this model essentially becomes y, or maybe I make it capitalized just as a random variable. Then y would be a random variable that follows a normal distribution with mean as fx and variance sigma squared. So this is how we specify the distribution of y, right? And this is a probability distribution, so it's probabilistic. But you can see that the implication of this is that y is continuous. And obviously this is not really appropriate for y being binary. So like in the classification task, Okay, so nested under probabilistic, if for a classification task, let's say y only takes two values, zero and one, then this is not appropriate. But what will be an appropriate distribution for zero one? Bernoulli random variable, right? So therefore we should, in this case, a reasonable probabilistic assumption is that y follows some Bernoulli random variable with the probability of success, right? With the chance that takes value one, depending on my feature vector x. So this is the uh, this is the appropriate formulation for Bernoulli. So then the case is that we would need. You see, this formulation will require. This will require that f is a map from p-dimensional space to zero one interval. Otherwise fx would not be a valid probability, okay? And then we can only think of f functions that satisfy this map, it maps to zero one. And then it happens that one, one function satisfy this purpose is what we call logistic function. Okay, so basically a function that satisfy this, one possibility, one possible, fx can be written as basically we can easily write as exponential function of x this is a p-dimensional vector i take that inner product with between x and the coefficient vector beta which is also p-dimensional divided by one plus exponential this so this function is guaranteed to be between zero and one. So for, and the X vector, the P components in X can take any real values, no constraint on that. And the beta can be real values, P real values. So this is, the, this is basically logistic regression, okay? So we are, so the idea, the logistic regression model is that we have an X vector and given the X vector, we are going to randomly sample y from this Bernoulli distribution. So here the randomness in our observation, in our observed outcome y is captured by Bernoulli because given the same fx, say 0.5, you may draw one, you may draw zero with half and half chance. So that's the uncertainty in your data. And so we don't need an additional error term to explain why y is random y is not equal to fx because fx is, a, is just a between zero and one, a, a probability, but y is binary. All right, so in, but in logistic regression, what you're trying to do, okay, the problem is that to predict, then you see the prediction problem in logistic, and this is what we call logistic regression. 
So then in adjusting regression, you know, people know in machine learning, we have a training phase, right? And the training, the training phase in logic regression is essentially estimate beta from your data, from this data, this y x data set. So I'll just say from the y x, this is your data, right? You use your data to fit, to, to estimate the beta. And that's what's also what we call fit the model. And with this beta estimated, let me call this beta hat, and it's estimated by MLE, by maximum likelihood estimation. And so basically I have another class, which I taught last year, we have the recordings, and that class 205 specifically explained all the details behind logic regression. So if you're interested, you can check it out. But we're just going to assume that we have some algorithm to do the optimization, maximum likelihood, and we get a beta hat. Okay, and then from here, how do you do the prediction? So now for new observation that comes in X star using the same notation. So you are going to obtain your, apply your estimated function. So you are going to apply C called F hat X star to the new point as the exponential function X star transpose times beta hat, okay? Divided by this. And this will give you a probability between zero and one, okay? And that's your prediction. This is exactly your prediction. So basically you are going to predict it as zero one. Then you're doing classification, right? You may want to, you, you, you don't want to have a number between zero and one. You want to threshold it. So therefore, the finally, the predicted y star hat, your prediction can be just the, the what, what is that? The indicator function that you threshold this f hat x star at 0.05. So that's what we did in practice. You threshold this predicted probability with 0.5 and you call it zero or one. And actually this thresholding has its theoretical foundation. This is called the, the Oracle, the base classifier. So basically it says that, let me just put it here. So the base classifier, just briefly mention it, which is also called the Oracle. In statistics, people use Oracle a lot. I mean, this is the ideal one. The Oracle classifier is actually what? It's actually the indicator that the probability that y is equal to one conditional on the x is greater or equal than 0.5. So this is known to be the optimal classifier in the, in the, Bayesian, in the base sense. So basically this classifier, I will say it's optimal for minimizing, minimizes this thing. So basically the expectation that the predicted y hat is not equal to y. Or I would say just the probability y hat is not equal to y. So it will minimize this, what we call the prediction risk. Okay, so this is the optimal classifier. So based on this theory, the goal is to estimate this probability. And this probability under the logistic regression model, based on this assumed model structure, this is exactly, this F hat is exactly our estimate for this probability. So that's why it makes sense to use 0.5 here. So that's not just regression. But you can see that even though it can be used as a prediction algorithm, but it has that inference part. The inference part is this beta hat, right? When you try to estimate beta using beta hat, you are doing inference. And then for this beta hat, from this beta hat, you can also provide like a confidence interval for beta. So you know how accurate your beta hat estimate is. So these are all useful information you can gain from logistic regression.
but not from neural network as, uh, as, uh, as, as at least from the standard practice for now. So basically, I would say that as a prediction algorithm, you care about the white hat, but as an inference procedure, you may be interested in the beta, just like what we did for the DEC2, if you recall. So in that case, if you are, so if the observations you have, like the data you have are, are binary, and you're interested in knowing whether there are some differences between two conditions. So in this case, you would use one of you, you will use one of your columns here to mean the condition, right? The condition being one or two. In that case, your column for the condition indicator will be binary. So one for condition two, zero for condition one. Then you are interested in the corresponding coefficient beta for that column. And that, that beta j, let's call it the j component being zero or not, will indicate whether there's some effect of your condition on the binary data you observe. So in this case, you can use logistic regression as a way to do differential analysis, not just for supervised learning for prediction. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, all right, sounds good. Then moving on, so to do, so let's say do probabilistic, right? We have the classification example. Now let's say we look at the algorithmic. Okay, for algorithmic algorithms, I would say for classification, um, and the dominant method that has been very, very popular is the SVM support vector machine. So this has been popular for many years before neural networks become popular again in 2014, I think. So the, I think the biggest advantage com of SVM compared to logistic regression is that it can separate, it can work for perfectly separated data which is something logistic regression would fail actually. So let's say that if you have two classes and let's say I have two dimension features. Okay, so I call this X1, X2. So for the two features, the two dimensions, P equals two. So let's say that my data points, the zeros are right here and the ones are right here. So they are perfectly separable linearly. You can draw a line to separate them. In this case, logistic regression will, will fail because it cannot really estimate this beta. I think the, the very intuitive explanation is that in this case, when you try to estimate this fx for each data point, they will become exactly one or zero. And one or zero will correspond beta to be negative infinity and positive infinity. So you cannot have a finite estimate for this beta. So logistic regression will fail for this case. This is a four vector machine by design. It's by support vector, right? It will find the largest margin to separate it. So among all the, cur all the lines that can separate them perfectly, you will find the line that has the largest margin. So that will give support vector machine a biggest advantage. And another reason is that support vector machine allows kernel transformation of your data. So let's say that your data looks like this. So you have a bunch of zeros in the middle and the ones outside in the circle. So in this case, in the original space, you can now find the perfect separation by a line. But just imagine that, okay, this is a good analogy I read about. So think about these are some, some, some objects you have at hand. You cannot separate them when you place them on a table in this way. But if you throw them to the air and you find that these things will become higher and the ones become lower, then you can find a perfect plane to separate them in the three-dimensional space. So that's the essence of kernel method. So if you cannot do this in the two-dimensional space, you transform them into a three-dimensional space. And in the three-dimensional space, you may find the perfect linear separation. So that's why support vector machine, by allowing kernels to do this job, it can do this perfectly, but not by logistic regression again. 
Okay, so that's the perfect machine. And now the more popular method is neural networks. Neural network. So by neural network, um, to put it simply, essentially, you are trying to find this F estimate. So this network itself represents F hat. So in this case, what you are doing is that you start with P dimensions, okay, P features. That's your input. And in the next layer, you are, let's say I decide I will only keep two new features. So then each new feature will be a linear combination of the original six features. Okay, do this way. And after do the linear combination, you apply a non-linear transformation to get a new feature. That's the key. So it's you do first do six variables linear combination, and then you apply a non-linear transformation to get a new feature. And then for the new feature, probably from here, you will finally predict your outcome. So the last step can be simply logistic regression. So you could do logistic regression in the last step. But before the last step, you can have several layers to do the linear, nonlinear transformation to gradually mm, transform the variables. Okay. So I will say the current deep neural network means by deep, it means that you have multiple layers, many, many layers. So in the middle. So that in the end, it's a way that that really does a lot of nonlinear transformation in your features so that you can finally make a good prediction. And so for, the, for this neural network training, here the training involves no likelihood because it's not a probabilistic method but what it does is that you need to define a clear loss function okay and for the loss function it's measuring the accuracy of your prediction so the larger the loss the poorer the accuracy and the loss function would increase the function of all the parameters in your network okay so it's a multivariate function and then what you would do is that you will use multivariate calculus as the way. So you will use a chain rule for many, many times to get a derivative for each parameter and against each parameter. And you try to, um, yeah. So basically you are going, you are trying to minimize the loss function by going in the direction of the descent of the, of the gradient. So you are basically going the gradient to minimize the loss function. So that's the essence of doing the neural network training. But as you can imagine, this loss function is a really complicated function of many, many parameters. So there's no way to guarantee that we can minimize the loss function. So we may be trapped at some local minimum and not a global minimum. So that's why a hot area of research about neural network is to understand why some of the local minimum work equally well for prediction, even though they are not the global minimum. Okay, so for this, you can see that this is a very algorithmic way of thinking. We are not talking about estimating parameters with some uncertainty consideration. There's no uncertainty consideration, unlike what we have for the logistic regression. Okay, so I think I try to give you a very high level idea about the distinctions and similarities about these algorithms. So I, I talk about classification for now. Now for regression. For regression, the key is that the y is continuous, right? So basically, algorithmically, the, the neural network can still work for the prediction, for, for doing regression. So outcome can be continuous. And for the uh, I would say probabilistic thing, probabilistic way, what we will do is that we will try to modify this. Okay, so you see that in, if we assume epsilon to be normally distributed, then we are essentially assuming the outcome to be continuous. There's no problem with that. But the key is that for regression type of work models, how do we specify the F? That's the thing we need to think about. So maybe I'll just look here. So to say that for the regression problem, instead of classification, and under the probabilistic thinking, we write 
okay? And with epsilon following normal distribution, I just put it here. So the question is how to design F. So if we make it simple, so that's why we call the linear model. If I make it simple, then F can just be some intercept I come to you plus X, the predictor times beta. So we could have this. Or actually, if I want to be fair for here, I should also add mu here, right? I need an intercept. So I'll just make it simple. I just say that here, the first column, that's what we usually do is the intercept. So that will have just all the ones. So these are all the ones. So one, they are all the ones. So it means that they are accounting for the intercept. So therefore I can drop the mu. Okay, this is a linear model. So no, and the linear model means that every predictor or features effect on the response, they are additive and there's no nonlinear transformation. Okay, that's linear model. And people, and so maybe I can write it down a little bit more. So it's like X one times beta one plus, plus XP times beta P. If you don't like the linear algebra representation, that's basically it. Okay, so the later people wonder, maybe some of the features have nonlinear effects, right? And that's where the neural network has a lot of advantages. So in this case, can I apply some transformation to it? And this is called the additive model. So it keeps the additive property, but drops the linear property. So in this case, your fx can be written as say, f1x1 times beta one plus plus fpxp times beta p. So here you can allow f1 to fp, these to be p nonlinear functions. f1, fp, these are all one dimensional to one dimensional nonlinear functions. So clearly you can see this is a more flexible way of doing the regression. It can fit a bit better but then you will have the overfitting problem to be considered. So I think maybe I'll talk about that next time. So for now, let's assume that you can find a way to estimate F1 to Fp as long as beta one to beta B. So these models will give you, so if you obtain the beta one hat to beta P hat, okay? Again, you will do them by MLE. MLE is just a, universal, I would say possible way of doing estimation. And why is that? The reason is that I would say uh, one of the biggest pioneers of our field, Fisher, he actually showed that MLE has very nice theoretical property. So that means if you can get MLE, that will be your first try. And it says that the, the theory says that the MLE is an unbiased estimator for the parameter asymptotic. So when your sample size goes to infinity, it will become unbiased. And this variance is the smallest possible variance you could obtain for unbiased estimators. So those two properties give it the optimal estimator status. So let's say we obtain this, right? And also MLD theory will also tell you the distribution of those around the true parameter. So you will also have like say beta j hat follows some normal distribution with mean as beta j as some variance you could actually do some plugging. So I just briefly put that it's like the Fisher information. I'll just without explanation that basically you have some nice theory about the distribution. And this can also allow you to do confidence interval construction for beta j. So that's why it's very nice. And these models, because of their additive nature, you could actually do inference of the effects. So you can easily say that, oh, what is the effect of the J feature on my response, on my prediction? So these are all the reasons why these models and the inference nature are very nice. Okay, and also for algorithmic, I don't need to say more. So the neural network 
still applies. Oh, and one more thing I didn't say is that another type of algorithmic approach, which I should have said is here. So besides SVM neural network, we also have tree-based algorithm. So tree-based algorithm can do both classification and regression. So maybe I'll explain it a little bit. So for the tree-based algorithm, I'm running out of time. So I would just say that basically in the classification sense, so still let's say two-dimensional. Okay, in this two-dimensional feature space, what you try to do when you do classification is that you want to do which way you want to cut it to do the div divide division of x1 into two space. And probably you want to divide x2 further, conditional x1 like this, and maybe you can do further division. So basically you're going to divide your feature space into some sub squares, and then you are going to label it as zero, one, something like that. So that will be your final prediction. So that's the tree-based algorithm and also tree, uh, this is called a decision tree. And the decision tree is regarded as a transparent algorithm, just as linear model, because you can follow the division to say, oh, given my new data, where do I go? And where, how, what drives my decision? But once you aggregate multiple decision tree into something called a random forest, then you lose that transparency. So that's something I will continue talking about next time. So try to give people a, 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 a high level picture about these algorithms. So I think I may have said a lot of scattered things today, but I'll try to unify things at the beginning of our next lecture. All right, so I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye.